Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to deliver this lecture. Uh, sorry, I said lecture, a presentation on um, the right ventricle and ARDS. Um, I'll just go straight right into it, actually. So the right ventricle has had an established association with um, ARDS right from time. Um, we've always known this um, with an established uh, knowledge that pre-existing RV dysfunction or evidence of severe pulmonary hypertension are known to be independent predictors of poor outcomes, not only in ICU, in ARDS patients, but generally in ICU altogether, <clears throat> because um, this underlines um, starting at a point which clearly is associated with an endpoint in the natural history of severe lung disease. The issue with um, looking and identifying right ventricular failure in ERDS is really much down to um, definition. The definition is very heterogeneous um, and it depends on who is looking at it, it depends on who is defining it, and it depends on the modality that's used to define it. In the days before now, when we used to use the uh, pulmonary catheter, um, there was direct information from the right ventricle to actually assess it. Uh, but now that we use that less and less, um, echocardiography has pretty much taken over. But clinically, there are some sort of clinical concepts that need to be, uh, physiological concepts that need to be borne into mind when talking about the RV in the RDS. Um, and there's, there's a few terms that I put on this slide. There's RV dysfunction, RV failure, and acute core pulmonale, which I'll be using quite a lot through this presentation. I mean, RV dysfunction is a very vague term that encompasses mild to severe forms. But RV failure, failure puritanically defines a situation where the RV is unable to maintain good cardiac output with, the, with a normal CVP. And acute core pulmonale is acute dilatation or dysfunction in a context of acute lung disease, and the key for there is acute lung disease. But also there's evidence of pulmonary vascular dysfunction. And this needs to be borne into mind. Now, in the context of this, um, this has been looked at, and is looked at by um, some investigators um, not too long ago. Um, and basically, in 2013, this paper was published in Test of Care Medicine to look at, it was a prospective look at all patients with acute core pulmonale with ARDS. And basically what they also did was actually all these patients were given protective ventilation as we know it, that is low tidal volume ventilation. Um, and the Kaplan-Meier curve here shows a, a, a split which is it confirms with a log, excuse me, with a log rank test that having acute core pulmonale is associated with poor outcomes as the mortality in the patients with acute core pulmonale is higher. Now that's it in the far end of the spectrum. But what this paper also shows is that some of the things that we actually find in patients who have ARDS that we kind of just ignore and think it's normal, actually quite prognostically important. So there is this concept of pulmonary capillary dysfunction. And for you to have mild pulmonary capillary dysfunction, all you need to have is a raised pulmonary artery systolic pressure of 40. Now for, for all of us doing echoes and you know when you assess the TR and someone who's on a ventilator, finding a PASB of 40 is pretty much quite normal. Um, but then if you add that with the with the with the with the presence of um, um, Dilated, a dilated RV and uh, septal dyskinesia, you start to get severe pulmonary capillary dysfunction. And as you can see, the 28 day and in hospital mortality in people who cluster all three is significantly higher than people who don't. And even people who have moderate disease, i.e., they have only one of those criteria, i.e., they have a PASB of greater than 40 or a dilated RV or um, septal dyskinesia um, have increased mortality compared to people who don't. So even the features that we consider as mild are sort of indicative of patients who would do worse. So people at this end of the spectrum are actually quite at the at the bottom end of the scale 
Uh, people at this end of the spectrum are actually the bottom end of the scale, while people at this end of the spectrum are where you want to be. But often there's nothing we can do about people at this end of the scale, because I'll come to the pathophysiology later. Arriving at this end of the scale doesn't have to do with what we do as patients, it has to do a lot with the pathology itself. So your approach to this patient has to be in the context of trying to prevent further damage and trying to limit death and trying to put in interventions that would stem the progression of the pathophysiological process. Now, if you look over the years, um, this is a, just a accumulation of papers since 2001 that have been looking at acute corporal pulmonale in ARDS. And if you can see the incidence ranges anywhere between 14% to as high as 50%. Now, the reason for this variability is all down to definition because different people are using different ways of defining acute corporal pulmonale in this patient, or they're using different modalities um, to define acute corporal pulmonale. And this is an inherent problem because it makes it very difficult to actually, one, prognosticate a, a, a homogeneous group, um, and two, it actually makes it more difficult to actually um, look for therapies that would homogeneously produce better outcomes in that group, um, which is one of the issues with the right ventricle. Now, the other thing with this is that um, I'm sure a lot of you are, are, are familiar with the Bayesian analysis of, of producing evidence, uh, which is a, a kind of a new way of looking at um, of, 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 of looking at evidence. Um, and one thing the Bayesian analysis tries to include when talking about evidence is the impressions of clinicians. And that has a big bearing on our diagnostic accuracy. And even if you're doing a study where you've pre-specified your inclusion and exclusion criteria, bias still comes into play. That, we, we all know that. It's not a perfect system. Um, there's bias and judgment that comes into things. And the notion of the forgotten ventricle is a very true notion because our, our, pre, our predefined position is to not bother about the right ventricle. And that's been true in the past, actually, because if you don't bother right ventricle and treat everything else, the right ventricle gets a secondary benefit and gets better. And that's been true of traditional ARDS. Is, is you, when you treat the lungs, the patient's RV gets better. So you don't actually need to bother about it. Unfortunately, I think COVID has actually made that less of an issue because COVID has actually enhanced and magnified the problem so that you now have to not ignore the right ventricle. The other thing is that now we're able to support patients with more advanced um, um, modalities that looking at the right ventricle becomes more of an important issue because you have higher modalities to actually support them beyond ventilation, which we didn't have um, sort of a few years ago. So let's look at the years. Looks like what's happened over the years. In the 70s, I don't know if anyone here is born in the 70s. I was born in the 70s, but I don't know anyone else. Um, but intensive care then was pretty much very high pressure. Um, plateau pressure was unlimited, high PEEP. And the ACP incidence in that era was really, really high. Um, and as we moved into more sort of Long protective, long protective approach, the incidence is reducing. And even now, um, there's a suggestion by, from this review that if you move towards an RV-centric approach, that is a situation where we stop saying, let's treat everything else, the RV will be looked after, and start to say, look, let's treat everything else with a view to helping the RV, will probably have a lower incidence. Now, I wouldn't talk about a lot of this because there's a there's a journal club at the end that, that talks about um, ventilation. I'll just mention it in brief um, so that I don't uh, duplicate uh, the presentations. Now, like I said, COVID made things um, really, really amplified. The, the RV problem became quite amplified in COVID. We've always known it existed, but it's, it's just been in the background. You find a select group of, of uh, academic intensivists who have a passion in it. And if you look at most of the papers, you see some names that recur. And that's because the people who are interested in the RV in the context of ARDS are very, very small. And because actually it's never been seen as a big problem. The incidence of ARDS has been reducing over the years uh, and a proportion of that has been reducing even more. And a lot of people feel, look, if you treat the RV, the, if you treat the lung, the RV will be better. 
But this is COVID. This was a paper from Birmingham, and, and uh, uh, this guy's initial the initial idea was to look at um, um, the, the, the the differences in RV failure between different races. Unfortunately, they didn't find a difference between different races. But overall, they look they look 164 patients, and the patients who had RV dysfunction as defined by a fractional area change less than 35 percent or TAPS less than 70, you found those patients actually had a poorer outcome compared to patients who didn't. Now, if if, if I go back and look, look at this graph and you go back to this um, graph, you can see that they look almost alike. Um, and that just exemplifies why a lot of people say, look, as a clinical pathologic entity, AR, um, COVID-19 ARDS is very similar to ARDS we've treated before, only that it is it notched up a bit more and it, because it's happening on a big scale, it's a pandemic, it amplifies every problem we've seen in ARDS before. And it also puts a bit of pressure on us as clinicians in how we manage it because the impact on mortality all, all of a sudden becomes very, very evident and becomes more important. Now, what's the pathophysiology of right ventricular failure in ARDS? And, and it's, the, the, the key thing is um, a, a raised PVR. Um, that's the, and the heart is actually, the right ventricle is quite well adapted to dealing with a high PVR. Um, it, it, it deals with it as long as it's a temporary measure. Um, it can do, we, I, I do thoracic anesthesia and you do pneumonectomies and clamp the PA cap, the PA, main PA, um, with, where the PVR really goes up, but the RV copes with it. Um, it's only patients who have pre-existing right ventricular heart function, uh, dysfunction that don't cope with it really well. Um, and we know in that population, the the big, the, the more lobes you take on thoracics, the, the higher the incidence of right ventricular dysfunction. But the same thing happens in ARDS. Well, unfortunately, ARDS is quite diffuse. It's diffuse, and the PVR increases due to hypoxia, hypercapnia. The, the the pulmonary vasculature is very sensitive to high CO2 and acidosis. So those two actually play a very, very key role in, in, in increasing your PVR. Um, now, the things we do to them, we ventilate them. Our ventilation has a, has a key issue, and hence by protective ventilation is RV protective. Um, limiting pressure and volume in the thoracic cavity helps to reduce your PVR. And of course, this thrombosis, I've thrown that in there because that wasn't an issue in the traditional ARDS, but in, in, COVID, in, COVID, in COVID terms, in, in the COVID era, it's become a really big issue because we know the pathology in COVID is existing on the vascular side of the epithelial alveolar membrane, uh, where you have a lot of macrovascular thrombosis um, and that coming together increase your PVR and, 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 the, and the PVR increase is non-vascular reactive, unfortunately. Um, you also get direct myocardial toxicity due to sepsis and a huge cytokine storm, which we see with COVID, but you also get it with sepsis. So one, one sepsis where we see it quite commonly is pneumococcal sepsis, overwhelming pneumococcal sepsis, where there's just depression of myocardial function. Um, often this is transient and actually when you just support them through this, they get over it within 48, uh, 24 to 48 hours. Now, what happens is your PVR goes up and plus or minus direct myocardial toxicity, and you, 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 the patient is goes into a diffuse inflammatory state where they're vaso and venodilated. Now, with the vasodilatation, the thing about the RV is that it's perfused both in systole and diastole, and a drop in your diastolic pressure and your systolic pressure uh, reduces myocardial perfusion, and the RV is more prone to ischemia in that state because it's not used to hypoxia. Unlike the LV, where it's used to just being perfused in diastole, the RV is used to be perfused all the time. And so um, any reduction in, in right myocardial perfusion starts to affect the RV, and that contributes to right ventricular dilatation. Now, once the right ventricle loses its tone, it's gone. And I'll tell you from my experience as a cardiac anesthetist is once you open the pericardium, um, forget about the TAPSI for a year. We know that in cardiac surgical patients. And that's because the right ventricle loses its tone a little bit, but it doesn't fail. Um, it, 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 it still works quite well. Hence why some surgeons prefer to bring their patients off by a pass a bit empty, just because the RV is the most prone ventricle to failing after cardiac pulmonary bypass. Now, in this context, once the RV dilates, 
it fails. And because it's dilated, it's lost its tone. And we know that tone is required to create a right ventricle wall tension. And without tension, you can't, Laplace rule, you can't generate pressure. And we, if you can't generate pressure, you can't generate a cardiac output. And that creates a vicious cycle. And that's made worse by having a high PVR in situ. So for the RV to fail, you need two things. Uh, a good RV, a normal good RV needs a high PVR and a reduction in perfusion. And once the RV dilates and loses its tone, it is a struggle to get it back to where it was before. Hence why in that paper by Anton Villabaron in 2013, you can see even patients with just right ventricular dilatation had worse outcomes. So looking at this, you could, you, you could ask yourself, there's, there's, sometimes there's nothing you can do about this patient's at the bottom here because they're presenting like this. In COVID land, we actually saw a lot of patients presenting with right ventricular dilatation from the off because of, of the nature of the pathology. So what can you do then? You know, it's, you, know you haven't ventilated them yet and yet they're already like this. And then, so you, the direction of travel is to start to have an RV centric approach, trying to have an RV protective approach to managing these patients to reducing the burden of, of the right ventricular dysfunction on the um, on their outcome. Now, how do we assess the RV um, in this context? I've just put a few echoes here, um, just from the FICE point of view. These are all echoes that you would take in FICE. This is an uh, apical four chamber view. There's a um, uh, parasternal short axis view, both uh, in, uh, just looking dynamically at the septum. Um, this is a, this is uh, sh just showing a bit of subtle flattening that you get with right ventricle dysfunction, um, and this is uh, uh, sort of an apical uh, view as well, um, showing the right ventricle, and this is TOE showing a mid esophageal four chamber view showing the right ventricle. Um, this is the measurement you will take. Um, you take a basal, mid uh, measurement, and a longitudinal measurement. Um, one thing that is, is, is very, very important is to actually, that, and helps you to actually de delineate RV uh, dilatation is to assess the RV end diastolic diameter compared to the LV diastolic diameter. Ideally, you want to assess the RV end diastolic volume versus the LV end diastolic volume. And it should always be less than one. Once it's one or greater, then it, it's indicated the RV is dilated and there's some, some RV dysfunction. So making a diagnosis, I put all these measures here, which I'm sure a lot of you might have seen um, in different places about um, how to assess the RV. Um, now, what, when, when I ask a lot of people, um, I've got patient X, Y, and Z, is the RV poor? And so, oh, yeah, the RV is a bit dilated, the task is okay, um, and the lactate is fine, so they're not in RV failure. And that is, a wrong approach, I think, is a wrong way to look at the RV because actually when you now have raised lactic cool peripheries, i.e. they're in cardiogenic shock, you've missed the boat. It's too late. Everything you're doing right at that point is chasing an established process. And I'm sure a lot of people here who've seen these patients know that by the time you start to intervene at that point, most of the patients at that point just continue to deteriorate in that process and, and, and the outcomes often poor. Um, so, you know, how would you then assess the RV? And this is a big question, a big issue in the in the in, in the world of uh, sort of assessing the RV. Uh, and, and it's been a recent review to look at what is the best way um, or what's the most common way um, to to assess the RV. And and, and this paper recently published actually just just this month, um, where it was found that, that a composite of a size ratio between the right ventricle and left ventricle as explained in the echo where you um, measure the right ventricular uh, diameter and the left ventricular end diastolic diameter and take a ratio seems to be um, in combination with septal dyskinesia i.e septal flattening seems to be the most common method so far and that is actually in keeping with a lot of the uh, definitions of pulmonary capillary dysfunction. Um, now we're moving, like I said, we're moving away away from pulmonary catheters. I think they're sneaking in through the back door. Um, you'll be very surprised at how many studies are going on assessing the right ventricle using the pulmonary catheter today. And there are new devices coming up on the market which are looking at specifically assessing the right ventricle. So watch this space. Um, 
because uh, the right vent the right pulmonary catheter is actually a right ventricular catheter. It's it's accurately measuring the ventricle you want to know everything about. Um, so it makes sense. Um, now, COVID actually taught us another thing about the right ventricle, which I, I don't mean to disabuse the concept of TAPSI, because I, you know, I mentioned you know, the right ventricle failing, TAPSI is fine. Yes, it's not a problem. Um, the TAPSI has uh, potential, the potential role to underestimate um, right ventricular dysfunction. Um, if you appreciate the, the geometry of the right ventricle, it's actually a pyramid that, that rotates on itself and it squeezes like that. Uh, and when when it's when it's and hence why the unlike the left ventricle where the ejection fraction is so easy to measure either on a 2D or 3D plane, with the right ventricle it is harder to measure because it's a, it's a pyramid, it's a four-sided is it well not four-sided but um, there's a septum and then there's a curve of it. It's a pyramid that squeezes on itself. So the the longitudinal function doesn't tell the whole story. There's a longitudinal function and there's a radial function and and and, and the, the resolution of forces that lead to right ventricular ejection actually multiple. Um, and so um, the TAPSI gives you an idea. It gives you a clue of where right ventricular, right ventricular ejection fraction is in health. Because the studies that assessed TAPSI and ejection fraction measured it in healthy volunteers. But in disease, it's a different issue because the RV, it adapts and, remo and remolds to adapt to, to compensate for the pathology there, especially when you have a high PVR. So this paper was published by colleagues in Brompton, <clears throat> looking at the different major ways of measuring, uh, of assessing the RV using echo. And you can see if you use just TAPSI alone, you get an instance of just over 20%. But things like RV VTI, or, which is velocity time integral, or fractional area change give you more, uh, a higher uh, incidence of RV dysfunction. So I think the clue for me here is that you need to have a multimodal approach. You need to use not just one index, but a multimodal approach to actually assess the RV, not just assess the RV, but also assess RV PA coupling, uh, because that is effectively what leads to the physiological um, result and, and physiologically contributes to um, the outcome you get. Now, a couple of invest some investigators actually um, published uh, this paper in the critical care, kind of looking at right ventricular PA coupling in COVID-19 patients. COVID-19 gave us a really good opportunity to assess this in our in in, in, IR, in ARDS because actually ARDS incidence like that was falling. So with with COVID and it, it been in pandemic conditions, you had a lot of patients who recruited into studies. Now, what these guys did was compare. They, they took a lot of um, um, parameters from patients who had COVID-19 and initially uh, put them in a Cox proportional multivariate analysis and two factors came out as um, indicative of, of, of poor outcomes and that was the TAPSI PSB ratio which is pulmonary systolic pressure ratio and, and TAPSI and a PF ratio. Now this is an, a surrogate of P, right ventricular P coupling. Now if you look at the couple of my curves on this part of the slide you can see if, if your TAPSI PSP ratio is greater than 0.635, you have better outcomes, but once it's reduced, it, your mass comes reduced. And same thing with the PF ratio. And what's more interesting is if you combine both, i.e. you have severe ARDS, you're needing 100% um, oxygen, and your PF ratio is less than 150, and your PSP, TAFSI PSP ratio is less than 0.635, in combination, your survival is very poor. So only 20% of patients survived as compared to the two. So of, of more significance is not just the morphological appearance of the RV, it is how does it translate into physiological function. So RVP complement becomes more of an of more important and hence why it's important to have a multimodal approach to assessing the RV. If you ask me what would I use, I would I I, I think in terms of um, there's some investigators in Glasgow who are very interested in RV as well, and they've postulated, and I agree with this, is that, yeah, RV is a complex uh, ventricle, and we need to have simple bedside way of measuring the RV. And I think two things that, that, that tell you your RV uh, PA coupling is poor is a reduction in your RV LV ratio, because that tells you that the RV is dilated, but also your RV is not able to provide enough preload to the LV, hence why your LV is smaller. So 
I think that is a simple a, a simple uh, way of addressing that issue. But if you can, fractional area change also gives you a, a very good indicator. So how do we manage um, uh, RV failure in ARDS? And prevention is better than cure. Like I said, once you have clinical evidence of cardiogenic shock, they're dying. You know, you, you, you've missed the boat. Um, so, um, you know, astute um, focus on ventilation, fluid management, and treating any fixed PVR states such as PEs, thrombolysis, um, and, and treatment of pneumonia, and ischemic heart disease. So, patients presenting with ischemic heart disease and pneumonia, which is not uncommon, um, is a recipe for disaster. So, we need to optimize the treatment of ischemic heart disease. Um, and like I said with the previous slide, early detection is is, is better. To, I think I think the other way to, to, to address early detection is is best to identify patients that are at risk and it's better to identify them early and then have an RV um, centric approach to how you manage the ARDS. And I think what that means is that it allows you to appropriately identify patients in whom you need to escalate treatment quickly just to give them that RV protective uh, management. Unfortunately, you're not going to succeed in anybody, but hopefully you'll be able to reduce the mortality significantly. Um, and then there's RV support, you know, um, with inotropes, uh, really incident preventive me mechanisms, and there's mechanical support with, uh, with ECMO. As an ECMO consultant, I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, so ventilation, I think this, this, this slide kind of summarizes the RV centric way of, of doing things in terms of Identify, pa identifying patients at risk. And this paper published in the, in the Blue Journal uh, in 2016 um, kind of creates an algorithm to kind of identify patients who are at risk. The things that we know that are um, that, that would help the RV is if you really reduce lung stress, if you improve oxygenation and you reduce hypercapnia, you will reduce um, RV failure. Um, and uh, I know the, the Journal Club paper is going to talk about um, the ventilation, ventilator side of things with regards to the RV, but things that, that, that have been found to contribute to reduction in acute core pulmonale in ARDS are to have reduced uh, driving pressures less than 18, plateau pressure less than 27, and to try and keep the PF ratio above 150. Now there is the role of PEEP, and I think this became amplified during COVID, where we found that the patients, especially patients with the um, with, um, with with the H type um, COVID who were on high PEEP, were were had poor uh, reduced preload, and a lot of them presented an AKI. Um, and what with PEEP, you need to have a PEEP. Uh, 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 you need to uh, not just dial up a PEEP, you need to assess and actually um, uh, titrate the PEEP um, for uh, a given driving pressure to give the patient the most optimal driving pressure to reduce the peak pressures. Um, so, uh, and every patient is going to be different and patients change with time because the lung compliance is dynamic, it's going to change with time. So as time goes on, we need to kind of have a look at what's the appropriate PEEP for the patient as the pathology progresses. Um, and, and, and there's a role of prone positioning, and, and I'll show you a slide in a moment that shows how prone positioning could improve um, uh, the situation with, with, uh, with, with, with RV failure, especially as it reduces your PVR by improving oxygenation um, and reducing lung stress. Now, a, a, a key question is, would you have, if you have a patient who has rocked up with you, who's got AR, severe ARDS, and you're doing everything for them, um, you've, you've, you've kept things at this level, left the driving pressure below 18, pass pressure above 27, you still can't get them oxygenated um, with a PF pressure going at 150 despite being prone, um, and you can't get them normal capnic or the hypercapnic is dropped um, should you be referring for ECMO? Um, and, 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 and uh, you know, puritanically, you'd say yes, that you should refer for ECMO if they are a candidate for it. Um, and, and I think there's no guideline that says that you should use an RV failure as a criteria for ECMO, but certainly we in the ECMO team use that, uh, use certain things as surrogates to, to, to identify patients who are at risk, especially when you have a patient who initially didn't require any ionotropes and often the ionotropic levels are going up and up and up and up is an indication that probably RV is failing. Um, 
So if you look at this paper, this paper is quite old, 2007, but nobody after this has done anything on proning and acute core pulmonary. But as you can see, the RV-LV ratio reduces as in patients with no ACP and in patients with ACP once you prone them. And so it has a beneficial effect, like I said, improves oxygenation, probably um, causes reduction in uh, uh, the VQ matching of, of VQ, VQ mismatching of areas that are severely consolidated versus areas that are not. So um, proning should not just only be seen as a way of improving oxygenation, but also a way of protecting the RV um, in an RV centric approach. Now, optimizing preload, this is really important, and, and I'll, I'll go back to the, the statement I made about PEEP. Um, it's really important to have a, a personalized PEEP strategy for patients. You need to look for the optimal PEEP that would give you the best, um, um, uh, would allow you to use the lowest driving pressure to obtain um, a, a, a reasonable tidal volume to, be able to ventilate your patients. It's really important, and it's important to review it as time goes on through the course of the, of, of the patient's um, ARDS journey. Um, now, if if I had a machine that could tell you a patient is euvolemic, I think I'll be rich by now, but there's no accurate way of measuring euvolemia. It is both a judgment and, and, and uh, a decision you reach based on the use of multiple information and adjunctively using either echo, CVP, pulse pressure variation devices, or using clinical parameters. Um, so um, I think when, when I respond to ECMO referrals, I, I simply judge for your volume because you can have a pa patient who puritanically on paper looks one liter positive, but you know that you know they, they've been parexic for a while or they've had diarrhea and stuff and actually probably they're a bit negative. So judging it. The RV is very, operates on a very, very narrow margin in the sense that it's unhappy when it's hypovolemic and it's unhappy when it's hypovolemic. So you need to kind of have, um, and, and I, have you noticed, I haven't put any figures there for the optimal CVP, because that comes, you need to monitor trends. You find that different patients are better at different ranges. Uh, and I, I've, I've had patients who at CVP of 20 is where they are happiest, where they have best cardiac output and, and below 20, they're not happy. The RV is struggling. So iotropes, and, and, and a lot of people might ask, uh, we use this. We, we use this uh, a lot and to try and treat these patients and some low dose ionotropy I think I think helps. Um, traditionally we've used the ionodilators. Um, I'll just be wary of, of patients who have LV dysfunction as well because it may worsen interventional interdependence and um, I, I, I always use I know dilators with a, with a vasopressor, to be honest. Um, no adrenaline has been found to improve RVPA coupling due to its ANREP effect. And vasopressin, because it has no effect on PVR, because there are no um, vasopressin receptors in the pulmonary tree, um, is seen as a, when you're needing to use high dose vasopressors as a preferential vasopressor. Um, adrenaline, um, at low doses, I think is, is beneficial, but at, at high doses, it becomes an ionopressor and to increase your PVR. And I think at that stage, you're actually dealing with, a, with a, you're actually losing um, with your RV. But there's no evidence that using an inotrope would improve your mortality. There's no evidence at all. Uh, even inhaled um, vasodilators, such as prostacycline and nitric oxide, um, they, unfortunately, they exhibit a tachyphylactic effect when you, um, when you use them. So, um, you know, uh, you usually get a bit of a response and it wanes over time. Um, so none of this have a mortality benefit, but they can buy you time. They can buy you time to decide and assess whether you can or should escalate to, to high therapy. And so what can you escalate to? You can escalate to mechanical support. And VV ECMO provides RV support as well. Um, so I, I often hear my unit, all patients RV is fine, they're on VV ECMO, the RV is fine. The RV is probably not fine because the RV is being supported in a big way. Um, Given VV ECMO supports the RV, um, reduces PVR to the RV, but also ensures that your RV has been perfused by very well oxygenated blood. So it, oxygen itself is an inotrope. Um, and I can count them out. Patients have gone to pick up around quadruple strength, noradrenaline and adrenaline. And with that, and ECMO, bring them back to Glenfield, the adrenaline and norad are off because the RV is happier. Um, 
Now this paper actually demonstrates that. It's not just me saying it. Um, uh, this paper by uh, guys from New York, Dan Brody and his colleagues, um, sort of look at um, what happens to immune pulmonary pressure once you've gone on VV ECMO. And you can see in the first 15 minutes, uh, the mean pulmonary pressure drops as your SATs improve and your mixed venous oxygen improves. So it, it provides RV support. The problem is, is that is this RV support sustained enough to overcome the period of RDS? And I think the answer was yes uh, for most patients, albeit a few, um, before COVID, where you had patients have a maximum two, three week run on ECMO and they're better. But now we're having patients who are very ill for months. Um, and actually in the influenza era, when you're on ECMO for over a year, we start to see patients present with really bad RV dysfunction. And we often identify RV failure as a, as a final common pathway, as a pre-mortality event. Um, but with COVID, it's amplified this problem a bit more. And uh, if, it's not uncommon to find patients on VV ECMO with persistent RV dysfunction. And I think that, I think uh, personally, and analyzing the pathophysiology of COVID is the pathology is not intraalveolar, it's vascular. I have a lot of vasculopathy. Um, my colleagues in Brompton published a, a nice paper using SPECT CT to CT patients with COVID-19. And even though there's no proximal clot in, in the pulmonary artery, there's so many perfusion defects in the lungs. Most of the lungs are, are, are deficient of blood supply. Um, and, and if it exemplifies the fact that despite the fact that you know, you've know you given optimal treatment, the PVR is still high and that right ventricle is still having to pump against the high PVR despite the support you're given. So what other options are available? And this is sort of looking into the future now. Um, you could do a wake ECMO without mechanical ventilation, but I think that only kind of addresses what we do to patients with mechanical ventilation. Because like I mentioned earlier, there's the issue of long stress. And, and, and I don't know if any of you has been following Luciano Gattinoni um, and intensive care medicine in the last couple of weeks. He's published a paper that shows that patients with long stress um, as defined by high transformative pressures measured through an oesophageal balloon um, are of, have a high mortality. But actually, you know, looking at that a bit closely, um, one, one thing I have struggled to, to do is get awake patients to reduce their, 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 their respiratory drive, especially young patients, even though they're on ECMO. Uh, I find it's very difficult to reduce the respiratory drive and that still stresses their lungs and creates problems. Um, the guys at the PTA in France have put one or two patients and published a paper in, in the Blue Journal regarding awake ECMO with good outcomes and they had a 56 day run. Uh, theoretically, it has benefits, but I think we need to actually look at this more to actually know if it's applicable to all patients or if it, it is the way forward. Because I think the pathology underlying COVID, this doesn't help to address that at all. Now you could do VAV ECMO, which we do quite often, um, especially in patients who are pre pre presenting with um, respiratory and heart failure at the same time. Um, and, and the key index patients that I, we know this helps really well for is patients with, with septic cardiomyopathy or direct metacarpal depression due to a, a cytokine storm or a very septic state. You put them on VAV for 48 hours. After 48 hours, they're better and they come off. Um, but the problem is the access you require for this are quite high, you require three access points. Um, but if and if you're having to give prolonged therapy through this, um, it starts to create issues. Um, and it's often a poor prognosis marker if you have to maintain this configuration for a long time. Uh, but it's a well-known uh, technique uh, uh, and we use it. Uh, it will decompress the RV, but it does not solve the problem of supporting the RV. All it does is decompress the RV, but it doesn't provide any pump, pump support for the RV. Hence why VP ECMO might look not more um, tempting because with VP ECMO, you're actually providing RV support. You're draining from the right ventricle and pumping into the pulmonary artery. Um, there's no remix, say you can tolerate lower flow rates uh, and patients are tolerated better because there's a pump in the pulmonary artery. So their, their cough and breath holding is unlikely to affect your flow as much. Um, but it's not suitable in certain states. If you have a fixed PVR state, i.e. if you have a patient who has 
pulmonary fibrosis or chronic pulmonary hypertension, it's not the thing to use. Um, and if you have concomitant LV dysfunction, it's actually not good for that as well, because it would increase the left ventricular end diastolic pressure and actually worsen the ventricle failure. So you need to select your patients. And theoretically, all these three could work. And some of our colleagues in Chicago um, in the first wave actually used VPA ECMO on all their COVID patients. They put all COVID patients on VPA ECMO. Uh, but this was part of a care bundle that included early steroids, that includes aggressive diuresis, um, and also include extubating them on ECMO and facilitating awake ECMO. Um, and I hope you can see this uh, very clearly. Uh, as you can see, this is a sort of a timeline of most of the patients. And you can see almost over 80% of the patients had been extubated on ECMO. Uh, ECMO initiation was about there, so about day four, but over 80% of patients have been extubated on ECMO, uh, and, it, and the survival at the end of the run was about 73%. And in ECMO terms, that's excellent, um, and that's quite difficult to replicate. Um, now, to prove this is a concept, we need more data, we need to do more studies, we need to be able to ensure we can actually replicate this. But like I said, it, ha it has been seen in the context of it being a care bundle of care, not just uh, VP ECMO. So, so what are the take-home messages for RV failure in ARDS, it is to have a proactive approach. It's an independent predictor for outcomes. It's best to identify patients at risk and have an RV centric approach to managing these patients. And consider mechanical support early. And when I mean mechanical support, I mean just, just ventilation in patients who are not ventilated, but also um, ECMO if required and if deemed to be appropriate. Because uh, obviously not all patients are appropriate for that. But we need more data, we need more research. And I, I think what COVID has, unfortunately, it's created mortality and everything, but it's amplified the syndrome of what we call ARDS, which is created by us intensivists, but also allowed us to be able to assess these problems a lot more closely. And more data is actually required to, in, to enable us to contextualize RV failure in ARDS and also manage it appropriately. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Thanks, King. That was great. Any questions from any of the guys here? Stunned silence. Does anyone else have any questions from um, who's watching? No, no questions from over here. Brilliant. That was really comprehensive, Akeem. I, I, I might have heard that talk before, but it was just as good the second time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I've succeeded in stunning everybody. We're all yeah. just not interested in, in, in the RV. But How can anyone not be interested in the RV? <laughs> <laughs> it's the forgotten ventricle, remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. I hope um, if you have any uh, I mean, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that in Glenfield, we uh, there's a network of us who are really interested in RV, and, and actually it's an international network now. Um, it's called Pro RV Net. Um, in one of the papers I, I presented, it's actually a Pro RV Net paper. I'll just show you, um, and uh, we are keen to do more work on um, protecting the RV. As a group, we've published quite a lot of stuff on, on RV and there's an international collaboration to include ECMO, intensivists and anaesthetists to look at um, ways of, of protecting the RV. Um, so, I mean, as trainees, if you want to get involved in our network, it's it's a really big network, um, you know, ECMO Net, the, uh, uh, the ECMO network, research network and ProRV Net are working together. Um, and um, we're keen to um, sort of do more work in terms of um, uh, studying and understanding the RV and how best to support it. Cool, awesome. So, unfortunately, for reasons outside of our control, we're, we're not going to be able to have the Journal Club paper that we planned this afternoon um, due to um, basically issues on the unit. 